Okay, well, thank you for um, uh, staying with the morning. We hope this is going to be uh, an entertaining segment. We don't have any charts or any PowerPoint for you, um, but we do have some um, penetrating stories of effectiveness uh, in the digital era. Uh, and we're going to also talk about um, the forthcoming 2018 Effectiveness Awards. So you can treat this as an opportunity for early intelligence on those. Um, we're going to have the convener of judges here, so it's a chance to ask them the questions about what you need to do to impress the judges in April. So in terms of the format, um, we are going to start by showing a short um, film clip about direct line. Now, this is a segment from a much longer film, which is part of the uh, invaluable series created by our partners at Thinkbox um, that tell the, the brand story of effectiveness award-winning cases. And you can find the full film on YouTube um, from now. Um, but we're going to show you just a segment of it which um, talks about um, the implications of the case. Um, unfortunately, we have um, one of the authors of the case here today in terms of uh, Richard Huntington. Um, from Saatchi and Saatchi. So after we've watched the segment, uh, Richard and I will talk through some of the learnings and insights from the film um, and what's happened since. Uh, we're also going to show a short clip uh, about The Economist, a case um, from the 2016 awards. Um, if you don't know that case, um, it's an interesting combination of, um, is Marsha still here, content, um, uh, but from a uh, reputable content provider, um, but also technology in terms of programmatic media uh, and contextual uh, marketing uh, and customer insight. And the reason why both these cases, we think, uh, can be framed within the Back to Basics is that they are built on an exploration of fundamentally what consumers wanted from the brand and a challenging of some of the perceptions in the market uh, about what these particular brands could deliver. So that's the format. We will um, show the, um, the films. Uh, we will, uh, I will invite the rest of the panel up for um, a discussion on stage um, and uh, to give them, um, both of them their due. That's Neil Peace um, from UM, the Group Digital Strategy Director, uh, and Neil Cobba, who is the convener of judges in the 2018 awards. Um, and Neil will also talk about a couple of other cases um, we think uh, this kind of um, approach is relevant to. Um, but also, we will talk about, as I say, the forthcoming awards. So, with no more ado, I think we should start. The business was in real decline, declining share of a declining market, and it was a pretty woeful place to find ourselves. Reboot has really turned around that performance pretty much from day one, pretty much from the launch of the campaign. We've seen brand health improve, customer numbers have improved, the brand has been in growth every quarter um, since we've launched Reboot. We've seen marketing effectiveness improve, um, quote volumes improve. It's been a real success story. Prize plum. Sorry? It goes well with Magnolia. Return on media investment is absolutely critical. Um, direct lines spend a huge amount of time analysing every line on the media plan to understand how it is working and how it is uh, uh, driving back. What we were able to see from this campaign was a 40% improvement in return on investment for the TV spend. So there's no doubt the TV is really critical for us. It's sort of symbolic of the idea, but also it's incredibly efficient. Um, and because the advertising construct is working so well, it's actually one of our best returning media lines from a marketing effectiveness point of view. So the win-win the is it get, has great cut through, feels very sort of emphatic, but also delivers the numbers. So it's sort of the first line on the media plan. And I know the world's going digital and we still do some of that, but it's still the first line on the plan. Well, I think the most critical thing that this campaign did was it readdressed how people were thinking about direct line insurance and the quality of the product. And that's critical in a market that is particularly commoditized and price-led and people looking for the lowest possible price for their insurance. Actually, what this did was get people to understand that quality insurance, that high-performance insurance was important and was particularly important to the, to the people we were specifically talking to. Can you send me a new one? Sure. Now your daughter Connie comes home at 3.30 in the p.m., correct? Uh-huh. That gives us 40 minutes to get the fudge out of Raj. Well, I didn't grow up as a boy imagining that I'd really want to work in insurance, but 
now I've been in it five years, it is astonishing how multifaceted and interesting it is. What, what I mean by that is with the advent of driverless cars, connected homes, artificial intelligence, blockchain, the sharing economy, it probably is the sector with the single highest propensity to be disrupted quite radically. In a nutshell, insurance has been a business of restitution, putting things right when they've gone wrong. But in the future, I think insurance will become a business of prevention, stopping things happening before they've gone wrong. And insurance will become more of a service of prevention than a process of restitution. The brand had been market leader, and so probably the biggest thing that the campaign has achieved is to restore that market leadership and the market leadership mentality that we can do big things, bold things, and triumph and achieve our commercial objectives, but also really re-engage the organisation and be proud again for the things that it did for many years. And rediscovering that lost sense of pride, I think, is the thing that I relate to most as the campaign's biggest achievement. Over and above all the, the numbers, it's really reconnected the organisation back to its purpose. I'm a big believer that when we do our job really well, it's about effectiveness, not just efficiency. It's about having an effect and also not taking no for an answer. I mean, not, not accepting. I don't see why any brand should have to accept the market conditions they operate in as, as a sort of given. I mean, Direct Line decided they were not going to accept that price comparison websites were inevitable way this industry was going. They refused to be on it, and we've turned that into a virtue. The importance of a brand in a, particularly in a market which can be seen as quite commoditized, and actually a product that you don't necessarily ever want to use, is, is really, really important. Um, because actually what people are buying isn't, uh, isn't an insurance policy. What they're, what they're buying is kind of peace of mind that everything in their life is going to carry on uh, going as, as smoothly as it possibly can do. Um, so yeah, the brand, the brand perception and the brand uh, behind that is critical. The bad news is that Joey here is going to have to remove your ball cock. Huh? The good news is that Joey's an emergency plumber, and that's covered under your direct line home plus insurance. I'll leave you two to it. For me, the first thing is, is that Marketing 101 is absolutely alive and well. So whilst how you take campaigns to consumers might have changed with new technology and new media, um, the, the golden rule still apply. You know, who are your customers? What do they really want? What's their unmet need that your brand is uniquely placed to deliver? Then how do you get your business to deliver that? And then how do you communicate that to consumers in a really compelling way? And that's kind of, that's what I learned back at university many years ago. <laughs> and it still applies today. And I think that's something that I'll take, that I'll take with me into future um, marketing tasks and challenges. But I think that's a real lesson to it. Well, it wasn't something we set out to achieve. You know, this notion of a golden thread, it gets talked about, but what does it really mean? But it, it was, as we, post-rationalise it, that the industry was kind of broken in terms of what it actually does at the point of need had been forgotten, dominated by price. Certainly a broken marketing team in terms of engagement, capability, confidence, pride, um, and a bit of a broken brand, you know, it was in systemic decline. Uh, and so isn't it amazing that the unmet need and the core insight that holds everything together is about fixing? And I think in fixing consumers' needs, we also fixed, to some extent, the brand, the marketing team, the business and, without sounding arrogant, I think the sector because now we're seeing others follow us down the route of differentiating and adding value to customers. Okay, so let's place that in context. Um, when this work began, Direct Line had faced five consecutive years of commercial decline. Uh, it was confronted by price comparison websites which seemed to be the um, go-to um, tool for people to use to compare brands, and it was losing share to its rivals. Um, so how did you arrive at the idea that the fixer was the kind of organising principle, not just for the advertising campaign, but for the organisation? Right, OK. Uh, so um, I, I think it was... Uh, Approaching that problem, and it was a it was a pitch, and lots of agencies were involved, and there was a, an amazing client brief that said we want to uh, to deliver the third revolution in insurance. They felt that they'd revolutionised insurance in 1985 when they'd launched. Uh, that the price comparison websites, and noticed that that 
horrible little <laughs> meerkat is over there. Uh, they, they created the second uh, revolution, and they came to the group of agents and saying, we want the third revolution of, in, in insurance. So, like, so long on rhetoric, and there were some, so, some reasons to believe that they might be able to pull this off. But... Uh, the, the journey started for me in, in trying to figure out what the market conversation was in which direct line was inevitably going to lose. So if you say, well, right now the conversation in the insurance market uh, is about price and cover at the point of purchase, which is what PCWs had encouraged us all to think, that's all that matters. Uh, that was a, uh, an argument we could never win. It was a conversation we could never win. And what we had to do was li literally drag the market uh, to a point where the debate was around how does insurance work at the point of need. So point of purchase to point of need. And that was the starting point. And then you kind of go, well, you know, is there anything about this brand or the, these products that seem to work particularly well? And we came up with this idea that uh, the direct line represented high-performance insurance. And then you kind of go, well, that's interesting because if we're high-performance insurance, then uh, de facto the others are sort of low-performance insurance. That's kind of helpful and, and neat. And it was then in discussing what uh, high-performance insurance that, that works when you really need it to and the shit hits the fan. Uh, that we then kind of got to, ah, well, uh, what they really do is, is fix things. And it was really, really scarily quick to get to, to Harvey Keitel and his character in, in Pulp Fiction. How do you sell an idea like that? Because it isn't an obvious jump from the fixing idea to the Harvey Keitel character from Pulp Fiction. Well, it seemed obvious. I mean, you know, like, I think the hard work was before... Maybe. Yes, it, it, the hard work was sort of before figuring out how, what, what right Direct Line had to win in, in this environment. You know, half the business had been eaten by price comparison websites over about a five or six year period. And there was no... There were, nobody would give you any odds on a direct insurer being able to fight back against this sort of onslaught of high salience, uh, low cost in insurance websites. And um, so I actually think by the time we got to, uh, well, it's about fixing things and putting them right, and I had this visceral sense, we might talk about this because it came out of a very ill-fated trip to Vietnam where I lost everything except the sh clothes I was wearing, something I now call method planning. Uh, but, um, uh, uh, I, you know, I was, trying, I, I was inhabiting this uh, world of of uh, how does it really feel when things go wrong? Like, you know, you lose your wallet, your bike gets knit, your home gets broken into. I think your profound sense is, I just want, I just want it to be an hour ago, mm -hmm. uh, or I just want it to be yesterday, before any of this happened. And that actually, great insurance wasn't about handing out cash, it was about turning the clock back, literally, you know, putting back your life back to exactly how it was before. Uh, and um, madly, th th it was a, one of those moments which I think if, if you work in our industry, you live for, which is getting into a lift in Bromley, having done the Q&A with the client and talking to Paul Silburn, who was the ECD uh, at the time, and he'd go, do you know what? It's, I mean, genuinely, it's a bit like... Uh, uh, Mr. Wolf in Pulp Fiction, you know, when they've blown out the brains of that bat bloke on the back seat of a Chevy Nova, uh, and Mr. Wolf comes around and tidies it all up, and do you know what, if he could probably do that, he'd probably sort out your broken phone. That, it's that sort of, I don't know how that happens, that's just mad. And how do you, because what, what the film, uh, the full film tells you, and the full case studies, it isn't just about um, communications, this is about reorganising the supply chain to actually deliver on that promise. It was about retraining people in customer yeah. service. It was about different propositions. So how did you market the marketing to make sure that message got through the direct line organisation? Well, I think to a certain extent the marketing marketed itself. And, and for all of our belief now in Inside Out, building campaigns, building uh, programmes of transformation from the inside out, Clearly, there's a point at which an organisation sees itself in the outside world and goes, ooh, that's, that's what we do now. So I, I think that that's an important part of it. It has to be said that Direct Line had got themselves to the point in 2014 where they knew they were in crisis and they knew they had to do what it would take to get them out of that. Part of it was go and have a chat with some advertising agencies. Um, but they'd also started to uh, reformulate their proposition. So there was always something. We had a clear clue that they were prepared to, to do what it took. But I've got to say, when we first, so not the pitch, in which Kerry and Mark, you saw in the film, uh, 
ha had the, a kind of visionary sense of this is what we have to do. Uh, but we, we went and redid the pitch to the whole marketing organization, the direct line group. Um, and there was stunned silence at the end of it. And uh, Mark Evans said, you know, you know, hasn't nobody got any questions? And somebody simply said, well, this is all great, but this isn't us. We can't do this. And I think the, the, the big challenge, which they sort of talked to a little in, in that clip, was convincing the organisation that it, it was this company. This was what it, mm. what it was always about, what it was born to do, and, and it had the right to fight. So was there something in the direct line DNA that having started as a disruptor and become a market leader made it easier or harder to do a corporate reboot? Because wouldn't the, the temptation have been to go back to tried and tested approaches, you know, we did it once before this way, why do we have to take this gamble? Yes, okay, so uh, I, I think it, having been the original disruptor uh, was helpful in a sort of um, rhetorical sense, I think, but by the time you'd got from 1985 to 2014, a lot of that uh, had been lost. A lot of it, I think, was beaten out of them by ownership by RBS before they IPO'd in, in 2012. Um, and they just lost it. And I, and I remember, I think so, sometimes, like, one of the, the reasons to go to the client's factory or office and, and wherever and just absorb it. I remember going around our first visit and there were blue paw prints bloody everywhere because that organisation really liked Churchill. But there was no sign of direct line. I had this real sense that they'd lost pride in the brand. And so a lot of the conversation was, you know, your communications aren't working for you, but that's not really what we're here to talk about. Actually... You've lost your mojo as an organisation. Uh, you don't believe that you have a right to win. Uh, and also this category has gone clinically insane because it's lost, seriously lost the plot. I mean, if the reason to you know, take up an insurance is you get a fluffy toy, uh, you, you know, this, that, that's a category that really has lost any sense of what it exists to do in the world. Do you think, um, more generally, brands are um, loath to challenge the kind of market wisdom? Because obviously in, in this example we've got a case of, of challenging this idea that you have to be on price before it's in websites. Uh, yes, I mean, just to be clear, that's our business model. We can't be on price comparison websites. Uh, uh, so that was never an option. I mean, and, 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 but I mean, lots of people are going, well, you know, clearly the, the right thing to do is go on price comparison websites. Uh, and of course, DirectLine has spent a long time saying, we're not on price comparison websites, to which people were go, would go, yes, I don't know why, because you're incredibly expensive. So um, we, had to, we, had, we had to find a way to change the conversation where it wasn't a good idea to be on price comparison websites. Um, <coughs> Whether it's accept, challenging accepted, I, I think it's, it's really unfortunate that, that, that more organisations don't. It, the, the phrase I'd use is refuse to accept defeat, you know, give in. And the example I'm really in, amused by at the moment is, you know, any of us who are working with a distiller, a big drinks brand uh, or business 15, 20 years ago, would have heard the mantra that, you know, like the future of white spirits is vodka, gin's dead, is never, you know, it's pointless. And then, then long, over here, you know, a bunch of people go, no, no, gin's brilliant. And so uh, the big distilleries, distilleries now are fighting over themselves to find artisan gin brands. It's just a good example to me that, 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 that you don't have to accept the fate of the market. You can decide uh, to, if you've got enough you know, determination and intelligence and imagination, you, you can defeat accepted wisdom. You have to be a, an organisation that's prepared to do what it takes, though, and, uh, and, and, and you will know that so many conversations we have, it's we need to turn around the future uh, of this brand, uh, but uh, we've got to do it with uh, these assets or this approach or this accepted wisdom. So uh, what's joyful, I think, is when you, you find a client who's, who, or an organisation who's going, going, no, I, I, I will do what it takes. Mm -hmm. I will do what it takes. And the client mentioned there that one of the great benefits of this campaign was the kind of growth or return to confidence mm. within the organisation as a culture, confident in what they do, confident in how they market it. Is it the agency's job? to build that confidence in clients? 
I don't think, it, I'm not sure I'd say it's the agency's job, but I think it's something that, you know, the, the members of this organisation are uniquely well placed to do because, um, you know, for, I mean, we talked about this a little bit before, but for all that the fixer is at the heart of uh, governing new product and proposition, uh, consumer experience on and offline internal culture and communications, and it's all very sensible, uh, there's nothing like that when you, you, you know, our ability to create this kernel of confidence that goes out into the marketplace and, and starts a, a client sort of thinking, oh, you know, actually maybe we're quite good at this. And I remember it distinctly when we did uh, the dance, I don't know if you remember in 2009 we did a, a, we did a sort of uh, flash mob for T-Mobile in Liverpool Street and, and suddenly the, that client, people know that campaign, they sort know. of perked up and went, oh, you know, that, uh, we do that, we're kind of cool, brilliant. And, and I think that um, th there is a, a power in what we do to, to, give, to give an organisation a sort of sense of, you know, wow, we're, we're not actually as crap as we think we are. And so often what we're doing is, is helping clients move from or organisations from a lack of confidence to a sort of belief in itself. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think that's part of the sort of the, the intangible or the soft skills of, of, of what we all do and, and what a pitch is often about. Not so much the solution sometimes, but just the kind of confidence. And um, given that the, the title of this session is about marketing one-on-one -on -one and back to basics in the digital era, um, one of the points made in the film is that TV was central to this particular campaign. There were other channels used and they were used in different ways, but you were doing things like putting your ads on um, the X Factor. Um, so why is that, I mean, what did you base the confidence that that would work still in this era? What did you base, did you have pre-testing evidence or was it IPA studies or was it history of? Uh, well, you know, between a client going, well, Winston Wolf, brilliant, let's do that, and it actually happening, a huge amount of, um, of reassurance. So, so Kerry and Mark were visionary in their ability to see how something might work, but not all of the organisation was, was felt that way. Uh, so we did a huge amount of work with the nursery qualitatively and Hall and & Partners quantitatively to prove... Uh, that this would work because, of course, at, at one level, uh, it's, this is clinically insane to employ a gangland fixer to, uh, as a brand spokesperson for an insurance company. So, so that whole journey had to, had to be to be worked through. I, I think the client was always looking for, as Mark says, a, a golden thread or, or, or a singular big idea that he could sit at the heart of of that brand. Uh, and so, I think there was an inevitability that. That, that television was going to be a really important part of that. I'd, I'd say probably that intervention, because what we were able to do was turn around its commercial performance almost on a pinhead, and I don't think that outside TV we would have been able to do it. It would be much slower build. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it was always, I think, going to be part of, and, and getting it something, a vehicle that was going to work superbly well in that media mm -hmm. was desperately important. And again, um, Mark, the client, talks about the future of the insurance category and the, and the potential for disruption, um, but also a, a new role which is more on the kind of preventative side than the fixing side, or in addition to fixing, perhaps um, being more sort of forward-looking. Now, is that something that agencies should do more of, look five years, ten years, fifteen years ahead to what effectiveness means in that era that's coming rather than just today? Uh, well, yeah. The how, do you, how do you do? Yes. Um, and why are you well equipped? Well, I think what I'd like to say, I, th I, th I think that increasingly the, the key role of the CMO is to understand the future revenue sources or, or, or uh, sources of revenue for an organisation because they're uniquely placed within uh, large organisations to connect the inside and the outside. Um, and uh, I think it's their job to be kind of scouting ahead and working out how this business works in the future. I think agencies are in a really uh, powerful position position to act as sort of consigliaries in that journey. We've just got to be better at, uh, at being able to, to, to see the, the path ahead and less obsessed with sort of meaningless, twaddly trends presentations about millennials wanting to care about the world in which they live. So I think a bit more muscular and less ornamental. That, otherwise, we don't. I mean, we won't have a role if we're, if we're just doing pretty pictures. And um, just one final question on direct line before we we'll move on to the Economist. Um, 
how important was it that Dairyline does have this direct connection with its end customer? Because some of the brands in this room, or represented by the agencies in this room, don't have a direct relationship with the customer. I'm thinking of an FMCG brand, um, where they don't have the data, they don't have the customer insights necessarily firsthand. They might be working through a distribution channel or uh, you know, some kind of intermediary. Yep. So what kind of advantage is it? I'm not sure there was a much of an advantage. I mean, you know, we had the data on our customers, but uh, the insight uh, wasn't about mining the data around our customers. That, that was like a, a genuinely a universal uh, insight around how people feel when things go wrong in their life. Um, and we, are, we were c blocked out of the main distribution channel in this, uh, and the default consumer behavior in this category. Um, uh, so I'm not sure how much of an advantage it really was that, that we could go direct. And, and all of us uh, can access the, uh, those visceral insights that exist uh, in human nature. Uh, we don't need, though it is helpful, we don't necessarily need to have that direct consumer relationship. And also, we're talking about insurance here. I mean, like, yes, we may have a direct <laughs> relationship for 33 days in a year. I mean, uh, the rest of the time, and this is why we've been doing things like Fleet Lights uh, last year and then last week. Uh, I mean, will you tell us a little bit about Fleet Lights? Yeah. Well, the point, point of Fleet, Fleet Lights is uh, taking, fixing outside the insurance category because uh, I was a bit, I'm a bit of a devotee of uh, Paul's Anatomy of Humbug book and, and, and the, the idea that we should be embracing a, a kind of every uh, way in which a brand and its communications might work. And I, I, uh, we've built a, a model that allows uh, Direct Line to create fame and momentum outside the category. Uh, and what we simply do is take our fixing prowess. And we, in the first instance, we took it to street lighting, because street lighting lights streets and not people. So we have a, now a, a pilot with the lifeboat service, lighting lifeboats when they go to rescue. And uh, last week, we launched a project um, which is trying to improve bringing technology to road crossings. Uh, uh, all of that is about working ahead of, the, of, the, of the, the point at which somebody goes, I've got a renewal letter. Shit, I need to sort out my insurance. Uh, and literally nobody wanted uh, to have a conversation about us or any other insurance brand in the 300-odd days that uh, the rest of the year. And, and I think that's desperately important that we find ways to do that. Mm -hmm. okay. Even a brand as successful and established as The Economist can completely transform people's perceptions. We were going to be measured on getting a brand new audience to start reading some of the content and then move them on to subscriptions. The targets were very aggressive, in fact. We needed to deliver at least 9,500 subscribers. We ended up building audiences in a completely new way using digital techniques and programmatic techniques. Right from the ground up, we moved away from TGI and small sample-based means of building audiences and started to look at actually a much bigger pool of people, the Economist's own subscriber base. We saw that some people were much more interested in technology or politics, and eventually we had segments which were defined by you know, what their passions were. This was ultimately a programmatic campaign. Programmatic is about how we get the right message in front of the right person. We can see from their behavior what they're interested in and we can connect the creative work to that. To do that, uh, our partners UM built a bespoke piece of technology that effectively used existing technologies and brought them together, but allowed us to scan the content of a page, the page you're reading right now, and match that to the content that we had from The Economist. As we brought them in, we would cookie the user. The dynamic uh, ad server was able to understand what content had been consumed. We know that you're into politics, so actually we've got these eight politics articles. The machine thinks that this one is the most appropriate for all of the, the various attributes that this cookie, that this user has. And that's where we started to get some really, really startling results. So the way it worked was that uh, there were two routes to creative execution. One was genuine dynamic advertising that was created on the fly that we tested. And the other was a bank of pre-existing crafted work that we developed that we would match on the fly. While that really unlocked the power of the machine to the max, they never worked as effectively as crafted work. So our target when we were, were briefed was to uh, draw in nine and a half thousand new subscribers. That was an annual target. We actually bust through those numbers within nine days, can you believe, nine days. Ultimately, we actually drove 64 and a half thousand new subscribers. Overall, those 64 and a half thousand subscribers will generate over their lifetime just under 52 million pounds in lifetime revenue. That's been a massive success for the business. So you had to have 
good tech understanding amongst the creative teams, amongst the data teams, and amongst the tech plumbing teams, as well as the strategy guys. It was a real instance of ripping up the rule book, looking at it with a complete fresh pair of eyes, actually a little bit of allowing your digital team to run amok. But I think there are a number of learnings that we can take out. One of the big ones for me is that balance of man and machine. We had this great technology that hadn't existed before, but to really unlock it, you've got to have the power of a great human creative mind. And when you bring those two together, that's when you deliver massive success. So, so Neil Peace, um, let's let's put that in perspective um, in terms of uh, what we saw was uh, a lot of evidence of growth in subscriptions um, uh, as a result of your campaign, and that was the main business objective. But there was also a fundamental brand issue here, wasn't there? That that people who didn't read the Economist had perceptions about the type of brand it was, the type of content it, it, it offered, and whether it was relevant to their interests. So can we start from that point of view in terms of how did you identify what the business problem was there and how did you go about solving that problem? Yeah, um, yeah I think um, when, we, you know, when we started working with The Economist, um, they, they were off the back of an incredibly successful um, you know, two decades of out-of-home campaigns, and these are iconic uh, out-of-home campaigns that uh, had done a great job as, as positioning uh, The Economist as a must-read for, you know, for the corporate world, for, uh, it's, it's almost like a banking bible. Um, and so that, that's great, and they'd seen a lot of growth from that over the years, but um, they'd seen that, you know, that growth was starting to plateau, and actually perhaps that, that I guess that audience was becoming a little bit saturated. So. Um, we, could, we could clearly kind of see that, and um, you know, through some of the great work that our uh, friends at uh, BBDO had done in terms of the focus groups, um, yeah, I mean, we, we could really start to see that that, um, that that kind of advertising had actually shut out a lot of would-be readers. Um, and for those of you that have you know have read The Economist, actually, there's there's a, a much greater wealth of, of content that's that's in there that would appeal to a much broader audience than just people who are working in. In Canary Wharf, science, culture, technology, etc., not just a financially driven publication. Well, ex exactly, and you know, it's yeah, of course. There's there's loads of content in there about business and finance and, and economics. I mean, the, the clue is, is in the name. Um, and also, there's a particular sort of customer journey, wasn't it? This idea of the Economist epiphany, when you read a couple of articles. Do you want to talk us through what was the basic insight there? Yeah, I mean, that, that was the striking thing. So again, you know, the, the, the research that was done through the, the focus groups that uh, BBDO had done was, um, was great in, in that as we started to look at, you know, people just, it was, we were looking at subscribers, um, we were asking them, you know, what was it that uh, made you take the plunge, made, made you become a subscriber of The Economist, and actually what, what came through really was everybody talked about this moment where all of a sudden, the Economist, um, they, they, they picked up an Economist, they'd read a, a particular article, um, um, you know, perhaps a, 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 an article on sustainability, and an environmentalist had picked it up, and all of a sudden, um, they had that, this Economist epiphany that actually there was content, content in there that was not only for them, but actually that was, that was kind of written in a, in a way that was, made it very simplistic, very easy to understand. So there, there was that, these, these kind of epiphany moments that, that we kind of cottoned on to. Um, but also, I think some people just didn't realise that the content was there. So not only was it content, was was you know there was a lot of breadth in the content. Um, actually, you know, some of the content was just completely unexpected, very provocative, you know, ground that you just wouldn't have expected the Economist to cover. Um, and that often was the very first thing that you know got people to just start reading it, and that led them on to maybe some of the more meaty content that's that's within. So the basic idea was you would use content from the Economist. It's more provocative headlines, let's be honest. Brew yeah. your own heroin isn't your standard Economist article. There's not a lot of heroin content in The Economist, no. <laughs> yes, I'm very disappointed to cancel that. Um, <laughs> but uh, you would take those provocative headlines, you would put them, make them available through programmatic media on relevant websites. So I might be reading about mm. um, police brutality in the States, mm. and then I might see a headline which says, you know, have the US police gone ballistic? I would click on that, because I think that's kind of interesting, it's relevant yeah. to what I'm reading. And that would take me through to a hub. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, um, th that was the case. So I think when we realised that you know these epif um, these economist epiphany moments were happening, um, you know, in terms of setting out the media strategy, the whole marketing strategy, I think we, you know, we were just thinking, well, how do we make these moments happen more often, um, and and how can media make these moments happen? Um, and to us, it, it was a very personal experience. So if you look at we didn't think that you know the uh, maybe broader media would would create a really personal 
epiphany moment. What we felt was actually, it was the content itself, the, which is the product, that was um, creating these moments. And actually, if we could just get the right content to the right person, um, that these moments would happen. Um, and so, we, yeah, I mean, we set about um, you know, building, building audiences um, that were going to be right for The Economist, that were progressives. Um, you know, we, we started with uh, The Economist's own first party data set. Um, we, we merged that in, in our own audience management platform. Uh, we have at UM, and we, we fuse that with second party data that we have partnerships with third party data to enrich it. And actually, what we ended up with was um, you know, six, seven distinct segments um, who were globally curious, who were progressive people who, who would, the economist content would resonate with, but who were defined by their interest. Mm -hmm. So, be it politics, be it tech, be it uh, environmentalist issues. Uh, once we had those segments, um, you know, they were there for us to be able to target. Uh, we then used a dynamic ad server, um, and what that allowed us to do was to scan. So once we had the segments built, we would um, be buying against those audiences, but it was also important to serve in the right context. So we profiled the audience out, figured out where they would be, made sure that the investment um, strategy was there so that we could be in those environments. Um, and then we added one final layer, which was, as I say, as I say the, the dynamic ad server, which was able to scan the page. It was able to understand what the nature of the content was on the page. Uh, it then looked back at The Economist website and made a match uh, of, of the best article that we had to the uh, content on the page, the person that we were serving to. And, and that's where we saw some of those great results. And how did you avoid the kind of um, bad practice in programmatic that we've seen? Either people being continually seeing the same ads, whichever sites they go on, mm. or um, alternatively, the, those ads appearing on inappropriate websites? Yeah. I mean, the, the answer actually is with great difficulty. Um, so, you know. Is it, is it actually possible to prevent those things? Yeah, well, I mean, we think so. I think, um, you know, it's, I mean, one, it, it, is, it is a big problem. Um, I think the problem is because the digital world is so fragmented. Um, and, you know, there are so many wall gardens that you have to, to I guess, jump over. Um, that, you know, you have to use this bit of tech to get to Google's inventory. You have to use this bit of tech to get to Yahoo's data. And unfortunately, those are frequency silos. Um, and then you look at you know, the amount of devices out there and just trying to stitch those up to an actual person. Mm. And again, you've got frequency silos. So it's, it's really difficult to do. Um, I think, I mean, our, our approach is to, firstly, as we've already said, we've got an audience management platform that is a people-based audience building platform. Um, and because we build those audiences centrally, instead of building audiences with, with several different partners um, in silo, we feel that because we've got that audience centrally and we're pushing them out to partners, actually we can be really measured in the way that we push those audiences. Because, and because we've got those audiences central, we then can understand the frequency build or push different audiences to different partners to make sure that we're not okay, so maybe the frequency. Okay, so maybe the right tools or refining the right tools could help you. It's, it's a little bit of that, for sure. Um, and we shouldn't um, give the impression that this is just about machines and automation. It's obviously called Magic and Machines in terms of the, the name of the film. Yeah. Um, and the point was made there that you were using both this kind of um, automatically created content you know, mm -hmm. taken from Economist headlines, but also crafted yeah. content. So someone was working on it to make it more provocative. And the crafted um, kind outperformed the automated kind. So I mean, is that likely to be always the case, do you think? Or is it just a matter of time before machine learning catches up with human yeah. craft? <clears throat> it's an interesting question. Um, I, so I, I think it's actually a lot more difficult to make the distinction. And I, don't think, I don't think it's as easy as man versus machines. Um, I think that in every single approach, there's, there's somebody who is, you know, who's designing that framework, who's, who's running those machines. Um, but I, I do take your point. I mean, what, what we found is, um, we had, a, we had a blended approach in the end. Um, there, is, there is no doubt that the, um, you know, the creative that came down from the proximity guys that was you know, more crafted, um, that was, uh, the copy was, was written by a creative person, it outperformed the dynamic creative that was built on the fly. The, the main reason for that, we found, actually, is like we said, we, built, we managed to build this system that could, you know, that could scan what, was, what we were about, the page we were about to serve on. And it could you know, scan the entire Economist library and, and figure out which article was, best, was the best match. What, what it couldn't do is, and unfortunately, the dynamic ad server would build the ad out of the, the article headline. And of course, the article headline was written by an editorial person. And it was for a, an Economist subscriber. You know, what, what it wasn't for is a progressive who has never read The Economist. A sampler. Yeah. Exactly. And so what the machine can't do is write um, really witty, a pithy, 
uh, ad copy. Mm -hmm. And so I guess until IBM Watson figures out how to do that, you know, the creatives are in the room, his jobs are safe. Um, and I mean, a bit like the direct line ca case, this wasn't just about um, the marketing department. There was a, a different uh, way of working, wasn't there, between the client and the agencies in terms of using the content. You were working more closely, I think. This was to you, to you Neil. Oh, sorry, it was me. Sorry, I thought it was to Richard. You, you were working more closely. Just, I see that there's a sort of comparison, I think. Um, with, with, the, with the proximity teams and economists. The economist content people, the economist marketing people. Yeah, I mean, we've just talked about, um, I guess, man and machine, but actually it was, it was a lot around the process and collaboration that you know, we had with the economist team as well as proximity team. So, you know, I think, uh, yes, it was communication. We were, we were on, at one point, daily calls to make sure that, you know, as, as the campaign was being set up, uh, that we were all singing from the same hymn sheet. Um, and that's abs it, it's crucial. I mean, if you have a content uh, marketing strategy, um, the one thing is that it's, it's actually very thirsty. And um, in order to be relevant and to get content out quickly, you know, uh, the economists write so many articles on a weekly basis, you know, that we, you need a system that is very slick. Um, and the only way you can do that is by working together. So, I yeah, I suppose um, there was, interestingly, for a, a group of people who are working on The Economist, there's no room for politics, right? You know, everybody had to just get on. Um, and so, yeah, so what we did was we had a technology in place whereby proximity could build ads directly into the ad server, therefore getting rid of any kind of creative bottleneck. Um, we also, um, you know, we, we would be very open about the media strategy, about the audiences that we were building so that they knew that the articles would fit into those audiences. Mm -hmm. And then finally, you know, the economists were <laughs> having all these conversations with their editorial team to make sure that we could get content that was going to be provocative enough, uh, provocative enough to, uh, to actually you know, move the dial. So, yeah, I, mean, I think it was it was a collaborative approach, and I think uh, the last piece I think was that that really helped was we had a we had a web hosted dashboard, so the media performance was actually able the, the proximity team could could access it as well, and that gave them a, an immediate um, instant steer on what content was working, um, you know, which ads were performing best, which ad copy, which style ads were the ones that were were, were performing best. So. Um, I just wanted to bring Neil Godber in, because you obviously were deputy <coughs> convener of, of, of judges la in the last um, cycle of the awards. So yeah. you saw this case. I mean, what do you think of the merits of this in terms of a, as a demonstration that programmatic can serve both a clear commercial objective, but also the brand, um, you know, changing the brand perception? Well, to some extent, it feels like that's one of the challenges that most creative agencies are fundamentally wrestling with. You know, it feels like a brilliant way of trying to both build a brand, but also do it within a highly um, trackable, traceable, dynamic environment, applying um, sort of almost like craft and creativity to technology. So it feels like one of the only cases, certainly that we saw in this um, or in the last. Uh, crop of entries and if you think more widely who has used sort of targeting and programmatic in a way that's highly creative and has drawn an almost instant ROI who's done it well mm -hmm. and, I, and I genuinely would sort of put that out there as a, as a sort of a challenge and a test to say what's what is working brilliantly well because one even one sort of sometimes hears about cases you know, really old cases like sort of you know links or acts and Romeo reboot and things of that nature where you're talking about 1500 iterations and there are some new things I think from your play and the like but there are very very few cases that you could honestly hold up in front of a client or in front of your own creative agency and say this this is what we're going for um, the second part I think is interesting is because a lot of the time, creative agencies still, the sort of the creative output can be sort of essentialist in some way. So I think you're looking for that one sort of universal, almost like unit of currency, uh, whether that be video or whether that be an individual image. And I think it's a brilliant example of saying, what if we were to produce a massive pool of content and then use that to push out and engage people in the right environment, that feels a really interesting progressive way of doing it. And, and I think that, yes, there are brands that produce content that's sort of long form content, it's educational, but to kind of cut through, break through, generate the desire to move people through, I don't see many brands uh, doing that well. Through to the revenue option. Absolutely. The it's subscription. Really, I, I think yeah. it's, a, it's a great case. All the judges thought it was an exceptional, exceptional case. Well, Richard, you know, we talked about um, in the digital era, is it more difficult to get to sell in that big creative idea and that big creative approach as opposed to a number of different digital executions on a more participation model? Uh, well, I think the, uh, this, well, this case shows 
I mean, the direct line case is, is that it is by having a central idea, not, not a central uh, executional idea, even perhaps creative idea, but a, a sense that this business is about fixing, not an insurance company. Uh, that's our starting point for creating work that works ahead of, uh, of, of, the, the, uh, of the purchase uh, process and stuff that's working in the last sort of five minutes of the purchase process. So I'm going to say... At the moment, I'm, I'm still minded to believe that that central uh, galvanising thought informs, can help inform <coughs> everything that you do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I suppose you could say that because it's based on The Economist's content, there's already been a long history of branding that's, that's let people know, at least the existing audience, what the, what the brand stands for, which this is building on. I mean, it's obviously challenging the perceptions amongst the non-newsers, but when you get there... You have a sense of yeah. They clearly have a very clear sense of who they are as, mm. a, as, a, as a brand. And what I love, one of the things I love about this case study is, is it's kind of contextual media uh, planning, and we've lost that skill or that belief that actually the context in which you consume uh, our work is as important as the as the actual message. Uh, and I, I think it's a really helpful sort of fight back against the the you know uh, obsession with individual targeting, regardless of where that that communication is seen. I saw you nodding. Does that mean in the 2018 awards we should see more good use of programmatic, more contextual media planning? Um, I, no, I was, I was actually nodding because so, sometimes, not sort of through work for the IPA, but from uh, other work that I do, it almost feels like context is everything as opposed to the creative and the content that goes in it. Uh, and to some extent, there's that sort, I think there's been a lot of play back and forth between sort of organisations that would just say, look, fundamentally the desire just exists. There's a huge kind of uh, pool of this stuff and your job is really just to kind of get in there, tap into it and sort of pull people along. And to a large extent, your ability to do that is driven, A, by things like the customer journey and, and sort of UX, CX and so on and so forth, but B, just being around at the right time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, by being able to talk to someone who is stood on a curbside at 2 a.m. and desperate for a cab, and do you know what I mean? That'll do all the heavy lifting as opposed to applying creativity and, and a sort of an organising thought to actually make an impact and generate that. And it feels like it's only now that people are starting to properly engage with both sides of that. Um, we're going to open up to questions in a minute, but I know you wanted to talk about three and the art fund as just other cases that illustrate this back to basics idea. Yeah, I don't want to hold us up for questions, but um, yeah. I, um, very quickly, you've got I'll a minute. Quickly. As they uh, say on the Today programme, you've got 30 seconds to answer this question. Oh, word. Okay, that's really hard. Okay, uh, so we love the art fund. It's a very small case, microscopic budgets. It was the sort of um, epitome of a modern day organisation in that the art fund is there as a, an art uh, preservation charity and that's its purpose, it has a very overt state of purpose so for everybody wrestling with brand purposes they had a very clearly articulated one and they doubled down because they had a sort of social dimension to that um, 101 we thought were exceptional in saying that isn't working, let's go back, research amongst the consumers, what do they genuinely want this, uh, what do they genuinely want and what are the benefits that they get uh, from donating to uh, this organisation and I love the fact that they went from a sort of noble purpose about uh, preserving art for the nation to actually it's a money, it's money off that I want. Uh, and you can imagine that cell of turning up, and I can imagine the organisation, and you say, actually, it's not all about pushing towards having these brilliant sort of artefacts that are part of the nation. Actually, they just want it for money off. They want discounts. Um, so I love that part. The second part I think is very good is Ron just doing advertising. What they then did was to say, how can we genuinely reframe the conversation? How can we get this... Uh, sort of donation and money used, they changed that into a card. So they then built, designed a membership card, so they sort of productized it and then advertised the product as opposed to just saying, you get money off with this card. Now they dressed it up and they, they made it feel um, very sort of palatable and the idea about never without art is, is brilliant, but fundamentally the core benefit was about money off. I should say in the 2018 awards you can enter New product development, new service development. New products, new services. Yeah, have to be comms com, uh, in, in the sort of traditional sense. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, the second one, and I won't spend long on this, is three. I think everybody knows about, about three and holiday Sorry. spam. Sorry. Yeah? Yeah. Um, so, 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 yeah, uh, again, you know, it, in a market that was either driven by sort of very high purpose and being the oxygen of the age or creativity uh, or just being absolutely swamped by sort of minutes off, 
Uh, the agency were brilliant in as much as they then went back and said, right, fundamentally, what is going to appeal to people and what, what hacks them off about using their network? And they saw that uh, roaming charges when you go abroad is the sort of massive, massive bugbear. They then persuaded the organisation to run, uh, well, essentially to change the, the service itself to offer no roaming charges, which is a big deal. So not only did they put together a proposal that did that, they then went back and said, OK, well, if we soft launch this, this thought, get users to use it, what do they use it? for and they very quickly saw that actually I think they use something like 71 times more data uh, which is pretty terrifying. Um, however, what they, the majority use of that data was about social platforms, and the majority of the use was essentially all about bragging and saying, aren't I having an amazing time? And that sort of gives you the nucleus for, uh, for the whole campaign. What they then did was not just say, look, at, isn't it marvellous that we allow all these people to brag? They then flipped that over and said, no, what if we as an organisation create a sort of public corporate apology for the fact that we're allowing these people to pollute the internet with all this horrific sort of spamming content about how marvellous of a time they're having? So, they, so if you like, the media approach, both in terms of targeting, is, is brilliant. But at a kind of macro level, it is, it's really idea-led. And the sort of, if you like, the big thought is more about how would a corporation say sorry? So then you go, right, how would BP say sorry? How did M&S say sorry? How did those other, uh, you know, other, other companies, corporations, countries say sorry? And we'll take that as the principles that we drive the mass marketing approach. OK. So anyway. Right. It wasn't a minute, but never mind. Thank you. Um, right. Who has a question for our esteemed panel, including our convener of judges? So now is your chance to ask about um, the new prizes that are um, available in this year's 2018 awards. Um. Thank you. A question apropos of The Economist, really, which um, was a sort of relatively new story to me. 64,000 extra subscribers, I think you said. Um, do you think there are any lessons here uh, for the future of print media more generally? Um. Lessons in what way? I mean, obviously, I think in in terms of the strategy, it was it was maybe atypical of the category. Um, you know, I think um, the Economist model, in terms of its um, you know its uh, financial model, its commercial model, is um, is dual funded, so it's it's ad funded as well as it is a subscriber um, a newspaper. And so I think you know it's no secret that the publishing world is 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 under threat. It's um, it's finding it in, incredibly difficult to monetize. Um, and so I think you know I can see that more more publishers are going to have to go behind a, a subscription paywall. Um, but I think with, in doing that, I think you know you still need to tease out your content. I think you still need to be able to communicate what it is that you stand for, as well as um, as well as show that actually you you have content that is worthwhile paying for. Um, and so I think that's really I guess at the heart of our strategy. It's putting the product first and letting that do the talking, um, and then. Making people realise actually that quality content. Um, there, is, there is so much, as um, as Marsha was saying, there's, there is so much content out there. Actually, putting a price on it almost shows the value of it. Mm. It's surprising, isn't it, when you look at very good campaigns own the weekend from the Guardian Observer or the Sunday Times campaign. It's much more about the occasion of using, you know, why you would use the Guardian at the weekend or the Sunday Times on a Sunday. It's not about the actual content. That's, that's not centre. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's an interesting approach for them. I think, you know, we've obviously seen this approach work extremely well for us, but it, it isn't the only, it, it's not the only thing that we're doing. If, if I was a print brand, news brand, and the news works are sponsoring today, but um, I think I take heart from the fact that, that you're showing that, uh, that the context, the editorial, uh, and a uh, match between editorial and advertiser is a, is a, is a winning combination, and, and that's uh, that's what I think we've lost. And that's what I would, if I was the Guardian or the Express, or whatever, I'd be kind of going, I want that's a that's a powerful uh, tool, and I want a premium for that advertising service that I'm providing. Yeah, no, I mean, I completely agree. Um, and I think, you know, there is a, I think it's a blend of the two approaches. I think there's, you know, as the um, um, Les and Peter have already said, there is a blend between, a, you know, brand storytelling as well as there is um, more activational and maybe more content approach. I think that overall mix, um, ultimately, you've got, you've got the product and, and what it is that, that we do, but then also we've got what the economists stand for. And I think increasingly, as our measurement approach is gotten a little bit more sophisticated and we've gone beyond last touch, 
we're getting a bit more braver in that area, uh, and we're starting to think about how we can tell brand stories and, and position ourselves you know, as, as what we stand for, as well as just pushing out the content and, and getting people to make, well, getting, driving those epiphanies that, that we've seen as being so effective. Okay. Another question from the audience? Okay, I shall just mention then these two new prizes we have in the 2018 awards. So, um, first, very straightforward, the Social Works Prize for the, the most effective use of social media. Um, doesn't have to be um, the only channel, I would be surprised if it was, but a channel, um, so which is a, a new award. And also the President's Prize, which is for, you have to correct me here, tech-led creativity strategy implementation. It's the tech-led aspect, isn't it? Tech-led data, sorry. So it's the use of data collected by technology in any aspect of the, of the campaign. So something like The Economist would have been a, an example. Okay. We enter it again, or...? <laughs> you, the nobody <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Right. Um, I, I don't mean to keep you from your lunch, then, if there's no more questions. Uh, it just remains for me to thank my panel, ask you to thank them. And thank you very much for coming to the IPA for this morning.